Hi. First of all, I would like to thank everyone who showed support to my leadership series that I made in 2017. And uh, I'm happy to inform you that there are now tens of thousands of people that watch those videos on a monthly basis. Also, given the fact that there are 80 videos in there and uh, there's quite a lot of content that might be uh, that might require a significant time investment, I decided to make a smaller series of six videos featuring some of the best advice from uh, the 100 and plus leaders that show up in my movies. So again, thank you for your continued support and uh, I hope you'll enjoy watching uh, this series. Thank you. I just want to know what happened to you, by which I simply mean, <laughs> was there a moment, a, an experience, an incident that made you suddenly take this very, I don't know, angry is the right word, maybe contemptuous, <laughs> hostile attitude toward the way the industry has been run up to now. Was there something that happened yeah. to change your mind? Listen, um, when I came to T-Mobile, I came because I looked in at the brand and the people, and I could see, you know, if you ever, uh, anybody ever go sing karaoke, right? Karaoke, that's the best way to say it. it the rule of thumb in karaoke is when somebody sings and they suck, go next. Right? And, and, okay? And I'm not, I'm not casting on individuals. I'm saying that that period that happened with T Mobile in the failed acquisition was terrible. And the engine was sitting on idle, but the cash was there. The spectrum was there. The people are unbelievable. The team knew exactly what to do. The company was being run as a subsidiary instead of a company. There was capital that wanted to come and play. You know, you get off your ass and get the iPhone and get the devices, start the consolidation. And I saw that this company could take advantage of an industry that's growing in the participation in the way. Now, what happened, I'm just a sponge. And when I got here and I talked with customers, I couldn't believe how contemptuous people, it wasn't like I'm unhappy. They hated everything about the wireless experience, the most important device that they have in their life. They hated it. They hated the carriers. They hated the experience. They hated the way you purchase phones. They hated the unpredictability, the bills, the inability to upgrade. And so I took that on as a, um, an, you know, our company being about being different from the carriers, being the uncarrier, being the one to bring change to consumers and knowing that it would change. And I'm just a highly competitive, uh, you know, I, I'd say midlife crisis, but I had that about 30 years ago. <laughs> and, and it's fun. We're a very competitive group, and it's fun. It's fun to win. It's even more fun when somebody loses and hurts while you're doing it. But the big, the big, big winner here is customers right now. This thing that we just announced, I don't, I don't know if it's going to make us the number two or three carrier immediately, but people are giddy on this because it allows them to go in and go to the other carriers and say, you know, what the F? I'm not doing this anymore. What are you going to do for me? And that's been different. You, but you want your life and you want this company, Alibaba, to change the world. And you are changing the world if, in fact, uh, you provide a forum for buying and you enable people to earn a living. Yeah. Um, but also, you believe that Alibaba ought to change the lives of women. So what are you doing? At first, I think uh, many years ago, I want to change the world. Now, I think if we want to change the world, we change ourselves. Change ourselves is more important and easier than change the world. And second is that I want to improve the world. Because it changed the world, maybe Obama's job. <laughs> because my job is to making sure that my team are happy. Because my team are happy, they can make my customer happy. If my customer, they are all small business. When they are happy, we are happy. It was, uh, and believe it or not, you're going to really laugh at this. As old as you know, convenience stores and gas stations were a new thing, right? This is the idea of putting food with gas. For a lot of oil companies, it was a big deal. And it was actually with Exxon in, in Canada. And so I pumped gas for four weeks, literally to understand what customers were doing. I, we did, the, the Exxon allowed us to build stores, like literally design them, how should they look, what the product should be. 
So I spent a year doing this and got really deep into, the, into convenience retail. And, but, but they didn't want to make a decision about building these things and I was really upset. because we, In fact, it got to the point where the client team and the McKinsey team were going to, we said, if they don't want to do this, we're going to leave and go and build this business because it's, it's a huge opportunity. Yeah. We're, and my mentor, who was a partner, said, you know, and I was going, these guys, you know, God damn it, they, I don't know why they don't, this is so obvious, it's a billion dollars, you know. And I remember my mentor, he said, you know, Dom, these guys are really smart people. At X, they're not idiots, right? They're not, so there's a reason they're not doing it. And it's your fault, it's your problem that you didn't figure out why. So I'm, I want you to spend six weeks and you're going to figure out what's going on. And, and, and what I found out was uh, that, so I alert, it was a big learning for me, was you've got to understand how an organization works, what, how decisions are made. And you can understand it at one level, but you've really got to understand it. So I, I went and looked at major investment decisions that, that they'd made over the last 20 years. I talked to different people and I found out one, simply in this case, it was not that the opportunity wasn't large, but at the time I think oil prices were you know, $22 a barrel. If oil prices went to $30, it would just, a billion dollars is chicken feed. It just would blow out any, so it wasn't relevant. And, and to then do a cut, well, now you're going to be a retailer and you're going to have food and you can imagine the... What do our any, engineers they ended up, know about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. And, but, but they ended up doing it, which was, I was very happy about afterwards. But I learned, I've never forgotten it. In a, you know, organizations are smart and there's reasons why they don't do things. And it, it, what it taught me was whenever you go into an organization, you've got to understand the culture. It, it's the, it, there's a, a book, one of my favorite books, called The Constraints of Corporate Tradition, which a guy named uh, Alan Cantrow wrote. And it's a, from a competitor firm, by the way. He was a Booz Allen. And uh, then he joined us afterwards. But he wrote it when he, and it was a, it's a book. It's, to me, it's a, like a Bible. Because it, it tells you how to understand a place before you go in. Because you can't just plunk stuff down. And it's good for leaders, too. You, if you're coming in, to a place you better understand the culture. So that was one. Do you hire people with integrity or do you uh, cultivate it within people who you hire? We switched a while back uh, and we try to hire people uh, that, that have personality. Uh, a while back we used to hire people that were good at unloading trucks and we figured that was a, a behavior we could teach them but uh, personality was important. Generally, if you hire somebody with good personality, they, they come uh, or can understand at least ethical behavior. So uh, we, we really look for personality and people that like people. Now, uh, you know, you spoke about uh, Roche being the biggest biotech company today in the world. Uh, if I look back over the last couple of years, uh, you know, I had the privilege to launch uh, uh, very important new medicines, uh, the financial results were fine, the share price went up, etc. But make no mistake, much of this success is due to my predecessor and actually to my pre-predecessor. And you should know that at Roche we have long tenures of CEOs. So my pre-predecessor uh, started in the 70s, almost 35 years ago, uh, my predecessor 20 years ago. And they took decisions at the time in terms of where to invest. They took decisions in terms of important acquisitions like Genentech. Uh, we took the first stake in Genentech at the very early 90s. You know, this was at a time when people couldn't even spell biotech. There was no product. There was nothing at that time. And people had the courage to take the risk and to think in the long term. Everybody knew that there wouldn't be success uh, immediate, that it would take time. And indeed, it took, a lot, a lo it took a lot of time. I also remember at the time that our share price went down. Uh, people didn't appreciate the fact that you take such a long-term um, approach and it took more than a decade until Genentech actually turned uh, profitable. And if you look at it today, uh, much of the success of Roche is due to our success in biologics, uh, which is directly related to decisions 
uh, which were literally taken uh, 20 years ago. I think for a CEO, it is extremely important. I think for the organization overall, but in particular for the CC, it is important to think in the long term, not to follow some fashionable trends in the short term. Uh, to accept that some of the investors are more focused on the quarterly results, but still ignore it and do the right thing uh, for the long term. And I hope that one day the successor of my successor will come back here to the MIT and can refer to some of the contributions I uh, initiated uh, these days. Yeah, well, the context, I think, is the following. We, we had 15 consecutive years of creating unbelievable value for every constituent that related to Starbucks. We were on this magical carpet ride where everything we touched almost seemed to turn to gold. Every city, every new initiative, every country. And the virus that came into the company uh, in many ways was the feeling inside the business that Starbucks was invincible. I felt very strongly that what I sensed was hubris and arrogance. Uh, you know, but if you look at the history of many businesses, this is something that is not an anomaly to Starbucks. That it, we just had runaway success, and as a result of that, things began to happen that, that just tore away the basic essence of what we once stood for. And then, for the first time in our history, we began to see negative comp store sales at Starbucks. And that, began, that became an opportunity for me to really kind of dig in and say, this problem is not going away, and in fact, it's going to get worse. This must have been kind of terrifying. You're a public company, one of the leading uh, figures in American business, and you're about to make a decision that basically says, which you're never supposed to do, right? Walsh was like, I, we were wrong. We, well, we've made mistakes. Yeah. That, that's, well, I think the hardest thing for any public company is to stand up and say, we've got a significant problem in the business. But when I came back in January of 08, uh, it was clear to me that one of the things that we had to do was speak with great honesty and transparency both to our people in the marketplace. And in the first three months of me coming back, uh, we began to do two things that were, were very, very unorthodox. And some of you might remember, the first thing we did was we closed every single store for retraining. Can you imagine standing up in front of the world and saying we have to retrain our people? And the reason we had to do that is because, going back to what I said earlier about measuring and rewarding the wrong things, we were not measuring and rewarding the perfect shot of espresso or the perfect beverage or customer service. What we were, what we were measuring and rewarding or customers per hour, transactions per hour, and how to create more revenue in our stores. So, so you know, the, the whole idea of closing the store for retraining was an unbelievable admission to everyone involved, internally, externally, competition, Wall Street, that we, we had significant problems. But it also was the beginning of speaking uh, with unbelievable honesty about how deep the problems were. And I knew that we couldn't begin to transform Starbucks unless we took a big step back and returned the company back to its core values. Secondarily, we did something else, and I think this is an important moment. Um, not only did we have self-induced mistakes at Starbucks that we had to deal with, but when I was coming back on the heels of that, we were dealing with the cataclysmic financial crisis of the recession. And overnight, Starbucks for some reason became the poster child for excess. And, uh, I mean, you can laugh, but it wasn't funny at the time. Uh, where, and then McDonald's was putting up billboards around the country that said $4 is dumb. And, uh, you know, that really pissed us off. Uh, uh, but, uh, so, the second thing we did was understanding something vitally important. And uh, I think it's important to understand that, that unlike almost any consumer brand that you could identify, Starbucks' relationship with its customers and the equity of the Starbucks brand was not built in a traditional sense through marketing and traditional advertising. It was built quintessentially by the experience. And that experience comes to life by our people. We are a people-based company. So the second thing we had to do was understand how can we effectively communicate 
with the most important person in all of Starbucks, which is the store manager. So we decided we were going to have a meeting with 11,000 people, the store managers of the North American business. And then the question was, how are we going to do this and where? And how much was it going to cost? Well, people internally and externally were very critical of me at the time saying, how much is this going to cost and how could you justify it? You'll be shocked to know the cost was $32.5 million to have a meeting for three days with all our people. And when I came under such pressure, I asked a rhetorical question. And I said, in, in this kind of crisis, can you tell me a better investment that we could make than an investment in our people? So we went forward with the meeting. Now, we had every municipality in America vying for this meeting because at the time, no businesses were traveling. You remember when things were just shut down? And we literally had a bake-off of municipalities coming in to present to us. And as soon as the people from New Orleans came in, we realized that these people have such like-minded values to our own. So we took the meeting to New Orleans. Before we spent one hour meeting with our people, we committed 50,000 hours of community service, primarily in the Ninth Ward, uh, where we really uh, provided real valuable contributions. And what we really were trying to do, I think, was rekindle and remind people of the guiding principles and culture of the company. And then we had the meeting. I know this is a long-winded answer, but it's important. No, it's just, uh, I, I've heard, I, I, could, I, could, I wish you brought the, I wish you brought yeah. the video, because it's just incredible. Uh, so I stood in front of 11,000 people after, the, after the, the community service day, and I basically took them through 25 minutes of explaining the situation. Now, as a leader, especially as a man, we are taught uh, perhaps not to be too emotional, never to cry, uh, and, and demonstrate strength and conviction. When I think about that moment and what I try and describe in the book, there's a word in business that is not generally used, and it's love. I love this company. And aside from my family, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for Starbucks and the responsibility that goes with it. And when I stood in front of 11,000 people, I described how desperate the situation was, and it was dire. We had lost $21 billion in market cap in less than a year. The stock was below $10 a share. Competition smelled blood. The crisis was causing tremendous problems inside and outside the company, and people were losing faith. And the press was brutal. The bloom is off the rose. Starbucks' best days are over. The board made a wrong decision in bringing Schultz back. He doesn't have a clue about what to do, all of these things. And I asked people to understand the three things that I needed them to understand. The first was what it means not to be a bystander. That every single situation that occurs in your store matters more than ever before. And if you overlook one thing, then all the other positive things we're doing that day is going to be diminished. And everything matters more than anything else. You can no longer be a bystander. And if you are, you're going to become part of the problem. The second and third thing is, what does it mean to really take things personally? And thirdly, what does it mean to really be personally accountable for the outcome in terms of responsibility? And framing all of that to really understand that it's not about 17,000 stores and 200,000 people who work for the company and 60 million customers a week. We can't operate at that level anymore. We have to reduce it down to the lowest common denominator one store, one Starbucks partner, one extraordinary cup of coffee, and the mission of exceeding the expectations of every customer. And I also said, as leaders and managers, we all have to understand we cannot exceed the expectations of our customers unless we, as leaders, exceed the expectations of our people. And the promise I made is we will transform the company financially, but it will not be success if we leave our people behind. We must do this in a way in which the culture and values of the company are embraced, preserved, and enhanced. And I think we left New Orleans literally on fire, with 11,000 people all facing in the same direction, realizing that the power and the destiny of the company was not in the hands of people outside, but was in our hands. And that began the transformation of the company, and that was in the middle of 08. 
One of the things that I'd been through as a student uh, was some leadership training. And one of the things they taught us was to have, uh, to not be afraid of failure. And, and instead to have the goal to fail a lot quickly and then eventually you'll succeed. And I sort of took this to heart and they also had a slogan called healthy disregard for the impossible. And they actually made you write down sort of the things you would do that were kind of impossible but you thought you might really accomplish. And that's really stuck with me in, in uh, everything that I've tried to do. And I think, you know, it was very, very close that we wouldn't have started the company. And I think there are many of you out there in sort of similar situations. You know, do you want to take a little bit more risk? Uh, do you want to try something out? And, you know, even if you don't succeed, we, we actually tried many things that didn't work. Um, you know, Google happened to work pretty well. Uh, but there are many things that we did that didn't. But we don't worry about those, right? Because we, we tried many things. So I just encourage you to take a little more risk uh, in life. And I think uh, if you do it often enough, they will really pay off. And one of the things I've stressed with us is that we started off as a freight forwarding company, all right? So we were not created in a dorm room or a garage, probably a stable. Uh, and what we did was we transported goods uh, from east to west, but we built up a level of trust. We had a focus on service. But then, in fact, we moved to traveler's checks, to travel, to payments. And one of the ways you drive innovation is, in fact, you have to constantly reinvent yourself. And you have to be willing to challenge the status quo. And so you can't look, for example, at payments narrowly. The reality is that when I talk about why we can succeed in the digital marketplace, I talk about the power of our brand, I talk about the service, and I talk about the information. And one of the things I say is that when the card was created in 1958, it was a platform to deliver services to the business traveler. So what you've got to do is you've got to expand the marketplace and you've got to get people to, in fact, be willing, and in my terms, what I say is try to become the company that can put you out of business and constantly challenge your business model, but do it from the standpoint of what are the customer needs. Put the customer at the center. Putting people first, perfect. Absolutely. For us. The how we use is Jeffrey Moore wrote a book called Horizon Planning horizon management. And what we do here is Google's often referred to it as 60-30-10. We have a 70-20-10. But what we basically say is what are the products today that have made us the mainstay in a customer's life, TurboTax, Quick and QuickBooks, and what are you going to do to measure the success of those products? It's also it's like market share, revenue, and profitability, but what are you going to do to continue to make them better tomorrow? And you put resources in there, in our case 70%. The next 20% are the adolescent products. Their products have already been proven. They're growing really, really quickly, and you want to fund them for growth. You don't expect them to be profitable, but you do expect them to get more profitable with every unit they sell. You've got to prove scale. And we put 20% of our resources there. The last 10% is unstructured time. These are the experiments. What are the ideas that could produce tomorrow's big oak trees? The one rule of thumb is general managers and business leaders have to have the resources allocated, and you're never allowed to borrow from one bucket for the other. So if you run into trouble in the short, you've got to reallocate your 70%. You cannot go borrow from Horizon 2 or Horizon 3, because otherwise you're stealing from tomorrow to take care of today. That discipline sounds easy. It is incredibly hard. But if you do it, it produces a steady pipeline of new ideas. You know the old saying that sometimes, you know, I think it's attributed to Confucius. Who knows if it's really Confucius or not. But um, seek revenge, and you should dig two graves, one for yourself. And, uh, you know, uh, really, uh, you just want, how do you, you always have to ask yourself, how do you want to spend your time? I would also say that public figure, you know, as a public figure, um, the best defense against, uh, and again, I'm not going to try to get into any particular story. This is not about um, Peter or Gawker or any particular thing, but it, the best defense to, uh, to speech that you don't like about yourself as a public figure is to develop a thick skin. If you're doing anything interesting in the world, you're gonna have critics. 
The only way, if you absolutely can't tolerate critics, then don't do anything new or interesting. <laughs>